In our studies thus far, we have traveled with God from Eden to Egypt to Sinai and then to Jerusalem. And we've seen basically two things. One, humanity has lost the image of God by choosing to serve the flesh rather than the spirit. And in so doing, they have become oppressive and violent. I read an article uh, recently about a fellow by the name of Daryl Scott. You may or may not remember him. He was the father of Rachel Scott, a, a victim of the Columbine shootings years ago. He was invited to address uh, a congressional hearing uh, several years ago, and the article was about uh, that speech or that scenario and the speech that he, he gave. And you can probably find it on, on, online pretty easily. Like Mr. Scott, I'm neither a gun advocate or a gun control advocate, uh, as either is defined by politics today. But when I read the article, when I read the speech, he, he made a point in his speech that carries a, a lot of weight with me. He, listen to what he said. This is Scott speaking, he's, and he's speaking to Congress. The first recorded act of violence when Cain slew his brother Abel or was when Cain slew his brother Abel out in the field. The villain was not the club he used, neither was it the NCA, the National Club Association. The true killer was Cain. And the reason for the murder could only be found in Cain's heart. In the days that followed the Columbine tragedy, I was amazed, this is Scott speaking, I was amazed at how Quickly, fingers began to be pointed at groups such as the NRA. I, he says, am not a member of the NRA. I am not a hunter. I do not even own a gun. I am not here to represent or defend the NRA because I don't believe that they are responsible for my daughter's death. Therefore, I do not believe that they need to be defended. If I believed they had anything to do with Rachel's murder, I would be their strongest opponent. He says, I am here today to declare that Columbine was not just a tragedy. It was a spiritual event that should be forcing us to look at where the real blame lies. Much of the blame lies here in this room, speaking of the congressional room that he was in. Much of the blame lies behind the pointing fingers of the accusers themselves. He said, I wrote a poem just four nights ago that expresses my feelings best. Your laws ignore our deepest needs. Your words are empty air. You've stripped away our heritage. You've outlawed simple prayer. Now gunshots fill our classrooms and precious children die. You seek for answers everywhere and ask the question why. You regulate restrictive laws through legislative creed, and yet you fail to understand that God is what we need. We are three-part beings, he says. We consist of body, mind, and spirit. We refuse to acknowledge a third part of our makeup. We, well, when we refuse to acknowledge the third part of our makeup, we create a, a void that allows evil, prejudice, hatred to, to rush in and, and wreak havoc. Mr. Scott, I offer a hearty amen. And I think that's the point that we've been discussing in these lessons. I think it's the point of God's story that is being revealed to us in the Old Testament, and it will be consummated, you might say, in the New Testament. When humanity walked away from God, oppression and violence filled the void that was created there. Oppression, oppression, oppression and violence became what humanity is. Oppression and violence became woven into the fabric of our cultures. We're not depraved by nature. We're depraved by choice. We made the choice to go away from God, and that put us in a depraved situation. When we take God out of our fabric, there's a hole that's left, and that hole gets filled up with the, the, the vileness of hell itself. And that's what God's story is about. It's, it's not merely about a God who exists or a God who is, who, who is, it's about a God, it's about what we become when we separate ourselves from that God 
who is. Even Israel, maybe particularly Israel, because they, they are the ones that were selected. They were the ones who were called out. They were the beginning of the redemption of uh, humanity, or at least the, the revealed part of that. They are those to whom God gave the privilege to show the world who he was. You are, don't worship any graven image. You are to become my image to the world. You are to reveal to the world who I am. You've been given that privilege. But they failed in that effort and became like the world instead. They chose flesh over spirit, just like Cain did, just like Eve did. They became oppressive and, and violent, just like the people of Noah's generation did. They were filled with the very vileness of hell itself because they separated themselves from the God who called them to be their, his bride, his people, his body, his temple. It's what happens when you leave <clears throat> the fellowship and shalom of Eden and follow the lie to Egypt and then to Sinai and then to Jerusalem. A second part of our focus of this God's story has been that our God is the God of the oppressed. Those who are the victims of the violence, those who are the victims of the darkness, those who are the victims of the depraved human heart, the heart that is depraved not because God depraved it, because God punished it with deprivation, but because they chose to walk away from the shalom of God and choose the chaos of depravity. And those who become the victims of that, they, God hears their cries. When they cry out, when those who are oppressed cry out, God hears their cries and God comes down to aid and to avenge them. That's the story of God. That's the story we see repeated over and over in the scriptures. God's story tells us that God avenges the oppressed. His vengeance will be poured out upon those who are the oppressors, whoever those oppressors may be. Before we move on, in this lesson, I want to again call your attention to the history. Remember, Cain was the oppressor. God judged him. The people of Noah's day were the oppressors. Their thoughts and imaginations of their heart were evil continually, violent continually. God judged them. Egypt became the oppressive society after uh, the flood. God judged them. And so when Solomon and Jerusalem follow the footsteps of their worldly forefathers, the Cains and the uh, Noah's generations and the Egypts of their day, they became the oppressors. And we should know then by now what God is going to do. In a um, kind of funny yet not so funny way, when you read the prophet Habakkuk, and we'll come to that uh, eventually, he called, Habakkuk did, he called upon God, he saw the Jewish uh, nation, the nation of Judah, and he says, they have just become horrible. I can't believe, God, that you're allowing these things to take place. You see how they are oppressing, you see how they are full of sin, and yet you do nothing, but they have become anti-kingdom, and it seems like you're not doing anything about it. So God said, okay, I'll tell you what I'm going to do about it. And when God told him, <laughs> he was taken aback. He says, oh, uh, how can you do that? Then when Habakkuk finally learned his uh, lesson, I guess, his lesson in humility, he makes the statement God is in his holy temple and all the earth keeps silence before him. Let God do what he's going to do. He knows what he's doing. The Hebrew scriptures have a very simple and direct message. God always hears the cry of the oppressed. God cares about human suffering. God cares about our situation, both uh, spiritually and physically, primarily spiritually. Uh, but he, he cares about our 
situation and the conditions that cause it. And as we have seen before, the scriptures show us that God is searching for a body. He's searching for a, a temple. He's searching for a community of people who will represent him, who will care for the things that God cares about. And God gives that community. He promises them, I will give you the power and blessings necessary to accomplish what I want to have accomplished. And he, he's not about himself. He's not about his own glory. He's about us being saved or about humanity being saved. He's about the victims of oppression and helping them. God gives power and blessing, as we learned from Sheba, so that justice and righteousness will be upheld for those who have been denied justice and righteousness. That's what God is like. You want a picture of God? That's it. He's the God of the oppressed. He's the God who cares about justice and, and righteousness, fair dealings. That's what he's about. That's who he is. And to forget this, to fail to, to hear the cry of the, of the oppressed, to gain wealth and power, uh, to preserve property and wealth and power at the expense of the powerless, it, it's to miss who God is and what God has called us to be, is to miss why God has put these things into our hands in the first place, and it is to put ourselves then in the hands of a vengeful God, a God who will avenge the oppressed. At the height of Israel's power, they misconstrued God's blessings as favoritism. Oh, God thinks we're better than everybody else. They believed that they were entitled because, well, we have Jewish blood. We have Abrahamic blood. Therefore, we must, we are better than everybody else. But that's, that's not why. That's not what God was doing. But as a result of the attitude that they developed, they eventually became indifferent to God and to their priestly calling to bring liberation uh, to others. And I think there's a word for this. There's a word for what happens when God gives us power and wealth and influence in order to provide freedom uh, from oppression in this world, but instead we use that wealth and power influence for uh, influence for our own comfort, for our own glory, and in the process become the causers of oppression rather than the relief of it. There's a word for that. And the word is exile. Exile is when we forget our story or when we forget God's story and that we are a part of it. Exile isn't just being sent to a uh, strange and oppressive land uh, or location uh, of, an, of an enemy na nation for our punishment. Exile is about the state of our soul. Exile is when we fail to convert our God-given blessings into blessings for others. That's what God gives them to us for. Exile is when we find ourselves, our, our, our nation and our church, if you please, a stranger to the purposes of God. When you're not promoting shalom, peace. You're promoting chaos, and therefore you have become separate from the God of shalom, the God of peace. When Israel became a stranger to the purposes of God, when she bathed herself in, in, in wealth and luxuries, disregarding the oppression of the, oppression of the, the poor, the oppressed and the poor, and became rather the oppressors of the poor, God says, that's not who I am. That's not why I chose you. And so he sent the prophets, men uh, of God speaking the words of God, powerful voices who per predict and, and warn of the in inevitable consequences of living outside the way of God. There are, we, we use the term, different kinds of prophets. There was the early prophets that we've talked about already some. There were the pre-exilic prophets, those who came before the uh, uh, exile. There were exilic prophets, if I can say that word correctly, those who were the prophets during the exile. And then there were post-exilic prophets, post-exile prophets that were after they came back, and they did come back. After Solomon died, we're in the book of Kings, book of uh, Second Kings, 
the kingdom was divided in two. God said it would happen. It was predicted because of Solomon's uh, sin. Uh, after Solomon died, the kingdom was torn in two. There was the northern kingdom called Israel, and there was the southern kingdom called uh, Judah, made up of the tribe of Judah and the small tribe of Benjamin, which eventually became swallowed up in Judah. In the north, I think there were 19 kings and there were 20 in the south. While there were a few times of confederacy or solidarity between the, the two uh, kingdoms, for the most part, they were at war with each other. They were mortal enemies of each other, even though they were kinsmen, sisters, uh, I think the prophets called them. The northern kingdom lasted approximately 200 years, and the southern kingdom lasted approximately 350 years. When you study the books of uh, kings, you will see the details of their reigns, particularly those of uh, the southern kingdom, but the northern kingdom as well. The chronicles focus only on the uh, southern kingdom of Judah. There's a reason for that, and we'll talk about it later. The prophet uh, Amos uh, came to the northern kingdom. He came from the south. He was from Tekoa of Judah. And he came to the northern, was sent by God to the northern kingdom of Israel. In Amos chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Hear this word. It's really a, a Hebrew, one Hebrew word, oracle. Oracle, announcement. This is the word from God. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you. O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. There in verse 9, he invites uh, the kingdoms of uh, the leaders of the Philistines and the leaders of Egypt to come and, and listen in as God speaks to the people of Israel. He says, assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria and see the great tumults. He's talking to the Philistines and Egypt. Assemble yourselves and watch what I'm going, what's going to happen or what's, in, what's happening in Israel. See the great tumults, the great chaos, the great um, uh, trouble, the great vexation within Israel. And that the, uh, see the oppressed in, in her midst. Verse 10, see how they do not know how to do right. See how they store up violence and, and robbery in their stronghold, declares the Lord. Another translation says, uh, see how they store up in their fortresses what they have plundered and, and looted. So he's asked uh, Egypt and uh, uh, Assyria, the Philistines, to be an audience to what's taking place there uh, in Israel, one of Amos's uh, first charges against the northern kingdom was that there are some people being neglected that are actually starving, while there are other people stockpiling surplus. Can you see that? I mean, this is among the same groups of people, the people who are kin to each other by blood. You have some of them starving to death in the same city that you have others stockpiling surpluses. They have uh, they're build, building bigger barns to have more surplus, you might say, as a New Testament illustration. And then he says that because of this, because there are some who are being oppressed and others who are being the oppressors, taking advantage of the oppressed, destruction will come. Look at verse 15, chapter 3, Amos chapter 3, verse 15. I will strike the winter house. I'll strike your barn where you store up your stuff. I will strike your winter house along with the summer house and the uh, houses of ivory shall perish and the great houses shall come to an end, declares the Lord. The prophet Isaiah, he was a prophet to the southern kingdom, a prophet to the kings of the southern kingdom, really. He says in chapter 1 and verse 15, God speaking through him, when you spread out your hands, when you pray, in other words, when you spread out your hands to me, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen, God says. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil from your deeds or of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Listen to him. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow, cause of the widow. Listen to that list that he gives here again. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves 
clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before, before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. Do you remember we talked about Solomon and his military bases and chariots and war houses that he built? God sees them for what they are. They are the unacceptable costs of empire. You're not building my kingdom. I gave you blessing, wisdom, wealth, power, influence. I gave you these to build my kingdom. What you're building is just like the oppressive kingdoms of the world. You're just like Egypt from which I rescued you. Your hands are full of blood. Don't bring them to me in prayer. That's what God's saying through these prophets. And the prophets didn't stop with condemning the empire. They reserved their, their harshest criticisms, you might say, for the religion that was animating them. You know, you see, while they claimed to be, uh, or while they were actually being oppressive to the poor and they were being like the world around them, they wanted the king to be like the world and they were, they were being that. But at the same time, they claim to be, oh, we're God's people. We're, we are the elite. We are his, we're the ones who have the right religion. Isaiah, God in Isaiah, compares them to Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen to him again, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 10. Hear the word. There's that word, Hebrew word, oracle. Oracle. God speaking to you, you rulers of Judah, uh, rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is this multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or, or lambs or, or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my course. Bring to me no more vain offerings. He's not saying I did not ask these things of you. He says I did not ask of you vain or empty offerings, a trampling of my courts with empty offerings. Bring to me no more vain offerings. Bring to me no more uh, your incense. It is an abomination to me. New moon and uh, Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and a solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast, God says, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. What's he saying? Your religion stinks. It's not that I had not commanded you to do these things. I did that. There was a reason for that. But now you bring to me this, this religion when your soul is vile. Your feast and your festivals they're evil assemblies, he said in verses 13 and 14. Evil assemblies, he calls them. God hates their religious gatherings. Now, you think about that as the church. If we live like the world and we bring him worship every Sunday, I'm there every time the door is open, but on Monday, I'm living like the world. On Monday, God's... Um, uh, presence in my life cannot be seen. And on Monday, I'm living like the world. I'm doing business like the world. I, I cheat, I lie, or at least I, I don't take care of the things that God has me here on the earth to take care of. God says, when you come to me in assembly, I hate your religious gatherings. Think about it. What does God do? Or what is God to do with a religion in his name that legitimizes indifference? We come here, we worship, we sing songs, we pray, we, we take the Lord's Supper, we, we preach God's word, but then we don't care about the oppressed. We see them. We walk by them and not look. We don't do, we're, we're not trying to take care of them. What is God to do when uh with worship that inspires indulgence of one and oppression of the other. In the same city, in the same neighborhood, we have those who are stacking up surplus and we have those who are hungry. It sounds just like Israel. What has God to do when time and money and energy of his people are spent on ceremonies and institutions that not only neglect the needy, but actually oppress them? Again, hear what the prophet Amos says to the people of Israel. Amos chapter 4, verse 1. 
Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountain of Samaria, who oppress the poor and crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring that we may drink. There's a whole lot there that we don't have time to go into, but think about what he just did. He refers to the women of Israel, the wealthy women of Israel, as cows of Bashan. The literal cows of Bashan, cows that were from the place called ba the area called Bashan, they were known for they were the big cows, they were the healthy cows, they were the well-fed cattle. And God, through Amos, is speaking to the women of Israel and said, "You're like well-fed, well-fed cows." How long is a preacher going to keep his job today if he says that in church? <laughs> Amos gets kind of ugly. He compares uh, these women to to cows who who graze gluttonously while others starve. I don't want you to get the impression that God has a problem with eating and drinking. There are times when God commands festivals. I don't want you to think that God has a problem with us owning things. Feasts and festivals and possessions are not the problem. God blesses people with possessions. He blesses us with produce. He blesses us with rain that we may grow crops. But it's when those things come at the expense of having others having their basic needs met. When you have been blessed with all of this and you see the starving man and let him stop, this brings great passion from the prophets of God who speak in the Old Testament. And that word that Amos uses, oppression, we first heard that in regard to Egypt with Israel, and we know what God did. Isaiah and Amos both insist that God is not pleased with worship offered by people who do not represent who God is. Listen to what Amos says in Amos chapter 5, verse 21. He says, I hate, this is God speaking through Amos, I hate, I despise your feast. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Just like Isaiah. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. The peace offerings of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. Take away from me the melody of your harps. I will not listen, God says. But let, listen verse 24, let justice roll like waters. Let righteousness roll like an ever-flowing stream. Justice. Righteousness. Do you remember where we heard that? The maintenance of, uh, of justice and righteousness is what Sheba laid at the feet of Solomon. God gave you all these blessings in order that you might maintain justice and righteousness. God gave you power. He gave you wealth. He gave you honor. He gave you wisdom so that you would maintain justice and righteousness. In Amos chapter 8, Beginning in verse 4, Amos says, or God says to Amos, Hear this, you who trample on the needy, you who bring the poor of the land to an end, you kill them. Saying, When will the new moon be over that we may sell and, and uh, may sell grain? When will the Sabbath be over that we may offer wheat for sale? When will the Sabbath be over that we may make an F of small, make the F of small and the shepherd great? In other words, make higher prices for less stuff. When will the Sabbath be over that we may deal deceitfully with false, balance, false balances, that we may buy the uh, poor for silver and, and the needy for a pair of sandals and sell the chaff for the wheat? You see the mentality of these people? God knows their hearts. People aren't actually saying these words, but they're saying it in their hearts. You can see how anti-kingdom has, has gotten into their blood. We can see how the corrupt kings, the leadership of the people, has corrupted the hearts of the people. The poor needed money to eat, so they had to sell themselves to, into slavery just so that they could eat. The needy were so needy that they had no shoes. They had to sell themselves into slavery in order to have a pair of shoes. The, the merchants of the day, you know, they claimed to... Uh, uh, they, they offered this vain worship to God on the Sabbath day, but they were in their hearts thinking, when will the Sabbath be over so that we can go back to making money? 
go back to uh, making the effort small, the, the quantity small, and the shekel great, the price bigger, and the dealing deceitfully, putting our thumb on the scales. When will the Sabbath be over? When can we finally get out of church and go and, and do that? Sound familiar? I can't tell you how many times and how many places churches have uh, put a, a clock on the preacher and we give all kinds of reasons and excuses for it. We say, well, we can't listen that long. The seat can only endure, or the mind can only endure what the seat, or take what, how much the seat endures. We give all kinds of excuses of why we can't stay more than uh, 30 minutes in an assembly, or at least in a, the, the preaching part of the assembly, and yet we'll go and sit for four hours and watch a ball game. And, and it's just ridiculous that how much we whine and complain about uh, sitting in the church building for an hour. And if we go past that hour, all hell breaks loose as far as how people respond to that. And what is it they're anxious to do when they get out of the assembly? Well, we, we go and we, we go to the restaurants. We, we, we go about our daily. We, we, it's not like it's something pressing or important. We just don't want to take the time. That's not my purpose here, but it, I wonder if we don't have some similarities to those people to whom Amos was, was speaking. We can't wait to get out of church so we can go back and start or, and deal with the world like the world. I read a story about a, an American POW in uh, Vietnam, I believe it was, who uh, along with his fellow prisoners was uh, starving to death or were starving to death. And the commander, uh, as a means of torture, uh, after starving them for some period of time, he brought them rice, or uh, wheat, I think it's rice, but the rice still had the chaff on it. The prisoners were so hungry uh, that they ate without taking the chaff. It was not good, of course, but it was sustenance. It was food. And so they ate and ate the, the rice and the chaff as well. And the chaff was undigestible. It was so coarse and and sharp that it actually destroyed the intestines. It caused internal uh, bleeding, and many of them, after much suffering, died as a result. It was intended to be a form of torture. Well, the Jews here were accused of selling chaff wheat to the poor and needy. What are they saying? We don't care about you. We'll sell you the wheat and the chaff for the same price that we will sell you the wheat. Does that sound like um, Pharaoh and the Israelites when Pharaoh took away the uh, straw? They had to get their own straw and yet make the same tally of bricks? Maybe that's not a comparison, but I think it is. There was no justice. There was no righteousness being maintained, and yet that's what God called these people to do. Well, God is patient. God is, is, is long-suffering, but we don't need to misunderstand that God is also pragmatic. He has a plan. He cares about the suffering of the world, and he will not allow the indifference of his people to stand in the way of his plan for that suffering. We need not to forget that all this is toward the end goal of bringing an end to that which causes pain and, and suffering. The thing that brings it all about is sin. God is trying to bring an end to sin, to destroy the, the power of the destroyer. He's going to crush the head of the snake, he tells, you know, tells the snake himself in Genesis chapter 3, the snake that seeks to destroy the, the human soul, the image of God within the human. Through Amos, God delivers the crushing blow. He says, therefore, in Amos chapter 6 and verse 7, he says, therefore they, that is the leaders of Israel, the wealthy oppressors of the poor, they shall be now be the first, excuse me, who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. In other words, those who are relaxing in Zion because they got it made so good, and he says, it will pass away. 
Amos predicts that the oppressors will be the first ones to be hauled away into part land and that came to pass. Amos preaches in a time that was very prosperous to the leaders, to the upper echelons of Israel, but there was extreme poverty in the land as well, but those with the money just didn't care. Now, if you were among those leaders who were stretching out yourselves in rubbery, you were taking it, eat, taking your ease in, not Zion because it was in Samaria, but how would you feel if this guy, Amos, a sheep herding tree pruner from down in Judah, your enemy nation, Tekoa, came preaching this message to your rich folks? Amaziah, who was the king's advisor, says in response to Amos' preaching, he said, you get out of here. Amos chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. Don't prophesy anymore because this is the king's sanctuary. This is the royal residence. You don't come in here preaching that garbage. Of course the king hates the message because it's against the king and all the king's friends. How dare Amos bring these crushing words into the inner sanctum of, of power? Churches don't like it either. When the preacher comes in and preaches the about the church, then the preacher is going to be short term. We want the preacher to preach about them, not about us. We want him to come in and tell us how good we are. Don't tell us about our flaws. Tell us how good we are and how bad they are. That's what we want our preachers to do. Amos says, Amos chapter 7, verse 14, to Amaziah, who told him to get out and don't prophesy anymore, he says, you know what? I was no prophet, nor a prophet's son. I was a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees, but the Lord took me from following the flock, and the Lord said to me, Amos, go and prophesy to my people Israel. I'm going to do what the Lord says. Now, therefore, hear the oracle, the word of the Lord. You say to me, do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Israel. The Lord says, your wife shall be a prostitute in the city, and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword, and your land shall be divided up with a measuring line. You yourself shall die in, a, in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile from its land. Amaziah got more than he bargained for. Amaziah didn't believe this, I think, it was when he slapped uh, Amos. But at any rate, uh, Amos says, you said don't prophesy. Here's what God says to that. A simple shepherd confronting the most powerful man in one of the most powerful nations of the time. His message is, you're about to lose it all. Your empire is over. It's not going to last. Your nation is going to go away into exile and never return. And oh, by the way, your, your wives will be treated like prostitutes and your kids are going to be murdered. Isaiah, Amos, Hosea, all the prophets that came to remind the people about Sinai, to bring people back to the marriage covenant they had made with God, to help them to remember that God is, is looking for a body. He chose you to be that body. You agreed that you would be the one in whom he would dwell, and, and he would be your God, and you would be his people. You would be married to him, but Israel didn't listen to the prophets. It's written in 2 Chronicles that in verse chapter 36, verse 15, that God sent the prophets because God had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. God wants to live among his people in a sacred union that he just established there at Sinai. He wants there, he wants there to be a sacred union of, of divine and human. He wants to have fellowship with them, but the human side isn't interested. Israel isn't interested. In verse 16 of 2 Chronicles uh, 36, it says, but they, that is God's people, upon whom he had pity, they mocked God's messengers. They despised God's word. They scoffed at the prophets. Amos got kicked out of the palace. Jeremiah was beaten and put in stocks and thrown into a hole, a pit. Isaiah, according to tradition, was stuffed inside a tree trunk, and then the tree trunk was cut in half just to shut him up. And the people don't change. They don't remember Egypt. They have forgotten the covenant of Sinai. Rather than use God's blessings to 
become God's representative in the world to uh, uh, dispense freedom and or freedom from oppression. They they take the blessings that God has given them and they eat, drink, and be merry on the backs of the oppressed. They become the oppressed. Their inhumane system of works uh, works for those who have power, those who have influence, those who have the power to change the system, but the poor, the oppressed, well, they're left with nothing to do but to cry out. And one of the reasons God gave the blessings that he gave was so that we would have, they would have the ability, that is, the leaders would have the ability to hear the cry, to answer the cry. They don't but God does. So for years, God is patient. He waits. He grieves in his heart with what he sees. He pleads for repentance. He sends judgment to turn them. But there comes a point when nothing else can be done. And so 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 17, the king of the Chaldeans killed the young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary. And he had no compassion upon the young man, young man or the virgin or the old man or age. He's talking about Nebuchadnezzar and what he did. No, this is the, uh, the Assyrians. This would be Sennacherib. They had no compassion upon the young man or the virgin, young man or the virgin, the old man or the aged. All the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and his princes, these he brought to Babylon. We are talking about Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me. And they burned the house of, of God and broke down the wall of Jerusalem and burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed its, uh, all its precious vessels. He took, uh, Nebuchadnezzar took into exile Babylon, uh, in Babylon, those who escaped from the sword and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia, so says the Chronicle. So everything falls apart. The temple is destroyed. Uh, people are killed. Uh, those who survive are carried into a foreign land called Babylon. And in Babylon, the servants become, well, the people, the survivors become servants. And what is a servant who serves against his will but a slave? And the Israelites, therefore, find themselves as slaves in a foreign land. Sound familiar? It sounds like Egypt again, doesn't it? All of this is interesting history, but it's not intended to be an interesting history. This is God's story. And it is as much about the, the present as it is about those Jewish kingdoms of antiquity. God was, God is, the God of the oppressed. God's kingdom was, God's kingdom is, the kingdom of light. It is the kingdom of peace. It is the kingdom to which Jesus invites those who are weary and heavy laden, the oppressed. Spiritually speaking, that describes you, that describes me, that describes the world. He came and he died and while that we were yet in our sins, while we were depraved, while we were depressed, while we were heavy laden, he came and he offered us freedom. But if we don't realize our spiritual enslavement, if we don't realize our spiritual poverty, we're not going to cry out to God for salvation. And I think that's where our nation is today. We think, well, look how great we are. Look how great we've got it. We've got lots of money. Great economy. Do what we want to. What do I, from what do I need saved? Until we turn our lives over to him to mold and to change, to, for him to transform rather than be conformed to this age. Until we turn to him for spiritual cleansing, we remain in our, the oppressive hands of Satan. You see, it was easy back in the Old Testament times when we speak of the oppressed because we see the physical situation of it. The poor being uh, sold for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. They're being trampled upon and uh, some are, are starving while others are, are committing gluttony. 
and we see the physical there, but that physical is a shadow of the true spiritual reality. And whether we're talking about Old Testament or New Testament, we are all spiritually enslaved to Satan because of the physical decisions that we have made that separate us from God. And I say it's a physical decision. It involved physical events, eating of the forbidden fruit, for example, but it was a spiritual decision. We chose the spiritual fellowship of Satan over the spiritual fellowship of God. And that brings a lot of physical calamities. Eventually it brings in oppression and, and, and what we've been talking about. God has heard our cry. 2,000 years ago, he provided the eagle's wings to bear us out of our oppression. He provided the blood of Christ. But like the people of Israel, God expects something of us once we have been redeemed and transformed. He says, I want you to let me abide in you. I want you to let me, or I want you to be my temple. I want you to be my body, whereby I may show the world who I am that they too may come. When God truly lives in the body, that body will do and be what God wants to do and be. If we act like God in this world, we will show his glory and we'll turn the world upside down. But if we become a part of God's kingdom, but continue to act like the kingdoms of this world, we disgrace God. We become oppressors rather than um, refreshers or those who relieve oppression. And like Cain, like Noah's generation, like Egypt, like Solomon, like Israel, will be judged. We need to take care and understand. You see, these books, they're not just stories about the histories of the old Jewish nation. It's God's story. And when we look at these books, we need to understand them as that. Uh, in your studies here in school, you're going to look at each book individually, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and sometimes you'll be tempted to get caught up in the, the history and wanting to know the dates and the kings and the, the events and what does this mean and what does that mean as far as the, what, what, did that, what took place there. And that's important. We need to see that. It's why it's there. But it's not why it's there. It's there so that we can see God's story and how that comes even down to our lives. Well, uh, our time is up. So thank you for your attention. And I will see you in our next class next week. God bless.